This is the um, drone economies uh, panel. And um, the notion of economies is certainly uh, a wide spectrum of, of possible readings. So um, I thought there might be two ways uh, to think or insert into this notion of uh, economies, um, the process of drones, uh, what I, I'm calling dronology. And uh, dronology is about um, creating uh, multiple valencies of insertion um, into the possibilities around two distinct uh, histories and terms. Um, drone, of course, male honeybee, um, connected to idler, lazy worker. Uh, male bees make no honey. Um, later on, of course, pilotless aircraft, 1946. And there's also, of course, hum, uh, excuse me for droning on. Um, sorry, I just had to say that. Um, so there is a sense then of a certain uh, insertion of the neuter of the male space as being uh, non-productive. And certainly one aspect of the drone of dronology and its economies is that it's really an unproductive, lazy working zone, an idler. Um, on the other side is the question of home, that is drones at home. And here we fall into the question of economy, ecology, oikos. Um, and you can see here that it's very much about the household, the house, the family, and a, a certain question of symbolic economies, affective economies, and market economies. So uh, dronology then is about the intersection between that wastrel space of male non-honey producing uh, systems and the care of home, of family, household. Uh, perhaps the, the schizoanalytic frame of the catastrophe of the post-contemporary situation uh, for the earth in general is that we are um, strange uh, hybrid entities, dronologist, um, lazy workers maintaining the house. Um, on a more quote unquote pragmatic level, um, US military unmanned aerial vehicles, or uh, I, I would say that's the politically um, correct term, a UAV uh, market, uh, is now gonna generate uh, a great deal of uh, money, revenue. Uh, here are some of the predictions and certainly uh, drones at home is literally about embedding ourselves here in San Diego, uh, one of the leading uh, lights of the drone market. And it's an expansive market, and at least from um, the space of the research right now, a lot of this uh, futures market is selling to uh, uh, foreign uh, entities, other nations. So uh, the market at least is very expansive for the US and uh, it won't stay that way for long, uh, but at least for the moment, it's uh, an up and coming uh, player in the system. Uh, in terms of um, uh, other uh, spaces, uh, the university is now becoming a space for homeschooled drones. Uh, the Federal Aviation Administration uh, uh, revealed that it has approved 25 uh, universities to fly drones in the U.S. airspace. Um, and uh, last fall, Kansas State University initiated the first degree in unmanned aviation. So there you have kind of a, a, a growing pedagogy, uh, a training of homeschooled drones uh, coming home. Uh, the spreading drone curriculum is, for better or worse, a sign, I think, of the normalization of dronology in the American household, if you will. Um, close to home, immaterial drone labor. Uh, Walter Benjamin in the Arcades Project uh, pointed out that uh, the commodity in the arcades was one which um, would place the world as 
out of infinite distance into infinite proximity. And, and certainly the, the question of the UAV slash drone uh, is a space in which it is uh, intimate in an infinity of the commodity, as we saw in the rapid uh, market evolution. And, you know, at some points it becomes a utopian space for the general intellect, as Marx pointed out in Fragment on Machines. And uh, perhaps uh, that this um, machine of immaterial labor uh, will create a relation between surplus value and the accumulation of capital in strange ways. Um, closer to home, or to the homeland, is uh, zombie drones. Uh, yesterday there were so several articles about zombie drones, and they can potentially offer a lot to the home economy. Um, and in terms of zombie drones, I was thinking of the Heideggerian question of the homeland, uh, and the homeland being one in which there were proper technologies of nearness, uh, economies of nearness, whereas improper technologies were one of enframement uh, that manifested themselves in improper uh, functioning of the home. And the improper functioning of the home was one for him which was about unlocking, transforming, storing, distributing, and switching per his uh, lectures on the power of ordering in 1942, 1943. Uh, and so this uh, Thanato-political economies uh, for Heidegger were about establishing certain questions and distinctions about what it meant to be in the homeland, in the motherland, in the fatherland, and the questions of justice and law, uh, quote unquote, uh, between humanizing technologies and the bestiality, uh, bestializing technologies. Of course, you have to put Heidegger's uh, positionality at that period uh, within the Nazi continuum. So this ontological distinction, distinction between what is proper legally um, in terms of um, drone economies is to find the space somewhere between the typewriter and the proper uh, forms of handwriting. Um, and ultimately what Heidegger uh, wants is to stop uh, technologies uh, from pushing men and humanity into a standing reserve of the machine. Uh, indeed, Heidegger in these lectures uh, makes it very clear that the leaders of this improper technology, uh, this uh, zombie dronology, uh, were the Leninist faction of machine culture. Um, this other fragment on homebound, I'd rather be a side drone, is something that came up yesterday in that uh, we um, can uh, create an oikos, perhaps a drone uh, via Haraway's cyborgs, um, create uh, some connections with Freud's prosthetic gods, another biopolitics of home at play in that case, one that might have potential uh, affirmative creative instances as manifestations of what Foucault signed as the techne of the self moving towards an aesthetics of existence, drones as an impulse of a communism of becoming a Gaia-like. And then post-homing drones um, are drones in the process of unmanning the homeland at a distance, uh, even infinitely so, and with a deep proximity that allows us to become attuned to an allegorical uh, or allegorical performatives of a collapse between infinite distance and infinite proximity where we can be both inframed by the economies of violence and the ability uh, to also reframe these infinities towards becoming otherwise, towards seeking other forms of the economies of dronology uh, via the law, via theory, via practical uh, speculation. Uh, this is more of a question than an answer, I know. So in this panel, um, we'll try to approach the ecologies of drones at home um, both in transparent formations, uh, perhaps opaque formations, and uh, the symbolic economies of aesthetic translucency on some occasion. Um, so the first presenter will be um, on how will drones affect economies, politics, and daily life. 
um, David, uh, who is here, is a scientist, inventor, New York Times, a best-selling author, with books translated into 25 languages. He has won multiple Hugo, Nebula, uh, and other war awards. David Stein's fictional Uplift Saga explores genetic engineering and higher animals like dolphins. Uh, his new novel from Tor Books is Existence, uh, with degrees from Caltech and University of California, San Diego. David serves uh, on the advisory panels ranging from astronomy, NASA innovative concepts, nanotech, SETI, to national defense and technological ethics. His nonfiction book, The Transparent Society, explores uh, the dangers of secrecy and loss of privacy in our modern world. It's garnered the prestigious Freedom of Speech Prize uh, from the American Library Association. Um, our next uh, panelist after this will be uh, Professor Orion uh, Kahlo. Uh, open drones, uh, legal hurdles to UAV slash robotics use. Uh, Kalo runs uh, the research uh, around privacy and robotics, including the disclosure by design and legal aspects of autonomous driving projects at Stanford Law School Center for Internet and Society. Kalo's work has appeared in the New York Times, the Associated Press, the Wall Street uh, Journal, and other news outlets. Kalo serves on several advisory uh, uh, and program committees, including the Electronic Privacy Information Center, the Future of Privacy Forum, the Mozilla Legal Advisory Board, and the National Robotics and, uh, and National Robotics Week. He is also co-chair, um, co-chairs the American Bar Association Committee on Robotics and Artificial Intelligence. And then following uh, um, uh, Professor Kahlo is uh, Arthur Croker, uh, after drones. Uh, Arthur Croker is a Canada Research Chair in Technology, Culture, and Theory, the Director of the Pacific Center for Technology and Culture at University of Victoria, Canada. His most recent book is Body Drift, Butler, Hales, Haraway, University of Minnesota Press, forthcoming fall 2012. His many book uh, publications include The Will to Technology and the Culture of Nihilism, Heidegger, Nietzsche, and Marx, University of Tor uh, Toronto Press, 2004, The Possessed Individual, Spasm, and Data Trash, The Theory of the Virtual Class uh, with Michael A. Weinstein. Uh, I have to say that uh, uh, all of them are um, new people and also uh, people that I've read and have been part of my life in multiple ways, and it is an absolute honor to, to have you here. Uh, and uh, so now, uh, David, if you'll come plug in. That goes right there. No, it's not there. Okay, then. I should. Oh, who'd have thunk it? It works. Um, oh, by the way, how much time each? Okay, I will try to keep track. Because uh, my wife talks about how, um, well, when she gave me a second chance from a bad first impression, that's why we're married. She was one of the few women who ever did. Um, she, uh, she uh, the second impression was a three hour Castro length talk I gave at Caltech and she decided that it would take a few years before she wanted to strangle me out of boredom. It eventually reached that point, however, after 20 years, so she doesn't come to my talks anymore. Uh, so, anyway, this is a fascinating topic, and I'd like to thank uh, you know, Ricardo and, and Sheldon for helping set this up, and I want to again plug what um, Sheldon spoke of earlier was the great news here at UCSD, my alma mater for graduate school, that we've um, got the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination uh, coming here. Uh, it's going to be very exciting. It's probably the most cross-disciplinary thing you've ever seen, and what impressed the committee most was that all of the deans on campus here signed on, every last one of them, from every department. Um, in any event, uh, I'd like to encourage you, those of you who are thinking of leaving, please do stay and see Alex Rivera's um, wonderful, uh, low budget, but magnificently done and very empathic um, film, Sleep Dealer, 
Uh, I saw it a year or two ago and uh, was very impressed, as I was last night with Jordan Crandall's wonderful performance, which um, I suddenly realized looks an awful lot like my uh, novel Kiln People, in which you can make multiple copies of yourself, only he was restricted having just one body to having to portray them sequentially. In any event, the notion of the drone um, is something that I think we're all going to have to get used to. And I think Lisa Parks was quite right on yesterday when she pointed out that we're going to face the choice between viewing these things as extensions of ourselves or viewing them as um, fitting into the niche that human beings naturally have within their minds for the lesser other or whether they will seamlessly fade into the walls and the world around us as um, extensions that do not require empathy. All of these are domains, and by the way, we may get all three. There may be kinds of drones that we consider to be our extensions. There may be kinds of drones or extended sensory apparatus that we must deal with with respect and there may be some that we deal with with the kind of blithe assumption of superiority or contempt that we used to apply to the, um, the servant castes and that still exist in, 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 in some societies today, and those that just fade into the wall. But the notion of including the drone in the notion of the sympathetic other this has been around in science fiction for quite some time. Um, Ralph 4235 plus C, was that the name of that uh, early sci-fi uh, novel? Back in the 1920s, it first introduced us Americans to the robot, although Carol Capek's um, RUR in Czechoslovakia appeared before that and gave us the term robot. The notion that um, the other can be sympathetic or not that the melded person, melded with machinery, can be sympathetic or not. We've all seen the notion of melded life forms, melded human beings connected to others through some instrumentality, uh, portrayed both as a dire uh, repulsive thing, as in the clanking Borg in Star Trek, and also, as in Asimov's um, Gaia, a notion that you, know, you, you, you sit in lotus position and you float and you're in connection with all the birds and the bees and all of that, and it's portrayed as being a, a uh, apotheosis of everything that's nice about us. The only difference is the clanking, and one would imagine the Borg be getting sick of that. Oh, and also the mon monotone voice, resistance is futile. Except for that, wh what actually is the difference between these, this um, positive and negative version? The sympathetic notion of the drone, um, it w uh, was pointed out at lunch today, uh, had uh, one of its earliest modern media representations in what I consider to be one of the great cautionary environmental um, self-preventing prophecies, God, God willing, um, of the uh, 60s. Uh, silent Running. Uh, very few of you have seen it, but you should. Uh, it's about a fleet of spaceships that it goes off to Saturn carrying the, our last forests after they've been destroyed on Earth. Bruce Dern, um, uh, Joan Baez did the musical score. And uh, the little robots, little drones, Drone 1, Drone 2, Drone 3 on the ship are all that's left when uh, Bruce Dern um, does the morally highly mixed deed that he commits. And they are very cute and they are uh, a case uh, where the drone, explicitly named drone, um, get, uh, is the, uh, as an object of deep sympathy and, and also ultimate sense of hope and liberation um, uh, that you uh, get when you have the, uh, very similar to the messianic drone, the uh, faithful servant who becomes the messianic deliverer that we saw in Wall-E. Um, and of course, the distinction between these stories being that in one story, humanity as in Avatar is almost unredeemable, 
whereas in Wally, humanity was merely foolish and, learn in, and is helped to learn from its mistake. Well, I'm going to uh, back off a little bit. Oh, how many minutes has that been? I don't get it to see here. I have no, I have no timepiece. Okay, well, um, in, any, in any event, one of the themes I mentioned in the discussion last night is the um, Gedanken experiment, the thought experiment, um, with these prefrontal lobes, these nubs above the eyes, that allow us to model ourselves in other times and places. They are also involved in empathy, allowing us to model ourselves in other people's shoes or in other people's uh, psyches. Um, in, in, um, so, so these, these uh, nubs above the eyes, and I made the little joke yesterday that I'd rather have a free bottle in front of me than a prefrontal lobotomy, da, 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 da. But the, those of you who managed to escape that yet, uh, by not showing up yesterday, I didn't want you to do without it. Um, I use the uh, Michelangelo's greatest work, his, um, his sculpture of Moses, um, as a metaphor for this. And it's the notion that we can explore possible um, dangers and possible alternatives without necessarily um, having to experience them. The notion that is implicit in science fiction is that we um, children are capable of learning from the mistakes of their parents. A possibility that is utterly and absolutely denied but on most campus um, literature and English departments, where they speak only in terms of um, e so-called eternal human verities and are deeply disturbed and hostile towards science fiction's method that tomorrow may be different. Well, we're experiencing that right now. Tomorrow may be different. And um, I'd like to talk about a few ways in which it might be. Um, does this move forward or not? Apparently not. I've got it, I've got it. The, um, the anchor notion for a lot of discussion these days is the so-called Fermi paradox. How many of you have heard of it? It is the notion that we should have, by now, after 60 years of looking, we should have seen some signs of extraterrestrial civilization out there. If nothing else, the remnants of past extraterrestrial civilizations. They, um, as a matter of fact, if you take a look at Earth's history, there were two billion years during which Earth was prime real estate without anything. Um, no, no, no. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now the, now the space bar will work. The whole notion that uh, the Earth was prime real estate for two billion years without anything um, higher than a slime mold to defend it. So why in these alien films do they just al also always happen to show up just when we're around to defend it? Um, it is a temporal piece of temporal chauvinism that, uh, shame on you, Hollywood. But the notion that um, this is a serious problem against which we can peg many, many questions. For instance, the notion, here it is. I knew it would be here. Oh, you got good. What the heck? Sorry about that. All right, so this is the so-called Drake equation. And it was used to roughly calculate the number of sapient, uh, intelligent, technologically, technologically detectable species that there might be in the galaxy at any given time. And what it all works down to is two, two great scientific cults, basically, are divided by that line right there. Because we're now finding that there are lots and lots of planets out there. So the, the fraction of stars that have planets is probably very high. The number, the fraction that can um, develop life is probably high. We have not proved that life is easy to develop, given the raw materials. But every single year, it seems more likely. Um, now, you start to get to the fraction that develop intelligence and the fraction of those that get intelligent that develop technologically past their difficult phases, and now you're starting to get very, very, very flaky numbers. And in fact, my crackpot position is, I think that humanity is got unusually smart, unusually fast. 
Um, but then the fraction that developed technological civilization, and then their lifespan. And the great dividing line is, do you believe that the great filter that reduces the numbers lies behind us in, the fra in these fractions that I just mentioned? And therefore, we're past, and we're going to be heading out into the galaxy. Or do you believe that it is likely that the explanation for the paucity that we appear to see in space of alien uh, civilizations is because great filters lie in front of adolescent cultures like us. And we passed one test, and that is phase one of nuclear war. Perhaps most don't pass that test. We're in the middle of struggling right now with a series of tests over, over uh, protecting our environment and, so, and resources so that our ge uh, future generations have enough resources and enough um, air and water, et cetera, to be able to move forward in such a way that others might be able to detect us. So these are very serious issues, and uh, I, I just don't have time to get into them, but it's the backdrop against which all of this is happening. And what we're doing is trying to discover a lot of these parameters. For example, this uh, graphic illustrates just how precious water is. Uh, if you were to extract all the water from the surface of the Earth, and I'm talking the seas as well, Earth would look rather much more like Mars, and you separate it out into a glob, and that's the size of the glob. Not very much, actually. It's a fairly dry place, not as dry as Venus, but it helps makes you think. It makes you realize that the water wars that we're going to be experiencing over the, rest, over the next couple of decades are things that we need to be addressing now. Well, the next five uh, illustrations are very unusual. They're done by the brilliant uh, web artist Patrick Farley. For only for the trailer that I've hired him for for my new novel, none of these none of these g glorious illustrations appears in the novel itself, but you'll be able to see them online. It's it's a very bizarre thing. Um, but in any event, what you see here is a portrayal of San Diego um, in the year 2048, and people are plugged in. They're wearing the descendant of Google goggles, but with displays on the inner surfaces, cameras on the rims, uh, where you automatically, uh, you can click your teeth or whatever, choose any level of cyberspace you wish, and the augments that overlay reality will change depending upon how you navigate. You're going to, uh, for example, be able to see a yellow brick road leading to your destination, or um, every, every single person who passes by will be wearing a name tag, never again be at a loss for people's names. Or you click over to a more detailed site and it's a name tag plus the first three sentences of their public profile. You click to a dissenting uh, site or a snarky site and you get three sentences of dissenting, dissenting opinions from their ex-spouses. Um, these things are all going to uh, you pass through another site and it's advertisements, you pass through another and, and you're getting um, real-time chemical analyses of the puddle that you're about to step into. Uh, or or um, uh, whether or not this person who's walking toward you down the street might be an ex-felon or on some kind of a list. They will be wearing auras, so this whole mythology of auras will come true technologically. And the question is, how will drones fit into this? Well, there will be, cam there'll be cameras, uh, you know these little um, um, sticker books, uh, sticker rolls that, that little kids get and they stick them on the walls. You find them all over the place. Uh, well, there will be penny cameras. You'll buy them in rolls. You'll stick them up there. They can't, the light, uh, the, uh, they'll have their own address on IPv6 um, cyberspace. And a battery that's good for a year or the little sticky tape will, pick, will, will recharge with uh, solar power. So, you know, it's, it's actually called my uh, corollary to Moore's Law. The cameras are, uh, are getting more numerous, smaller, uh, more agile, and cheaper um, at a pace that far exceeds Moore's Law. And I talk about this in the Transparent Society. Um, and the choice that we are going to face is, will we panic, uh, outlaw them, and therefore, all the elites will still have them, but we won't. Or will we learn to embrace this world and you learn to uh, embrace reciprocal accountability as a way to 
reduce the power of powerful elites, including the government. Now, uh, these are some of the others that are going to be rising up in our world. Uh, like it or not, science fiction often uh, portrays this with, uh, in a cautionary sense or a worried sense. The interesting thing is that most recent Planet of the Apes movie portrayed the rise of the apes um, not as a um, disaster, but as, a, um, as, a, as an accident of happenstance that is not necessarily um, uh, a bad thing. In my uh, science fiction stories, I take it to the opposite extreme from the standard um, doctrine on, the, on uplift, which is what, uh, quote, Rainer Smith and Pierre Boulet in Planet of the Apes and and H.G. Uh, Wells did in, the, in um, the Island of Dr. Moreau, and that is to routinely and reflexively portray the new technology as being vile, or the breakthrough as being used automatically for bad purposes, to enslave um, the new other. That warning has been given, and so in my, new, in my Uplift series, I portray such things having been done with the best of intentions, by a civilization that desires other voices to be included for their wisdom and for their diversity. Uh, and yet, even so, that being done with the best of intentions, there would still be, at minimum, interesting problems and probably a lot of pain. And this is what I explain to people when they come to me and they say, oh, when are we going to start doing this wonderful thing so that 200 years from now we have chimp philosophers and dolphin philosophers join us in our civilization, I say, well, if I could press a button and get the outcome, I would do it instantly. But I don't have the wisdom to decide to subject um, 20 or 30 generations of chimps and dolphins to the kind of pain that this journey would entail for them. Uh, we would have to talk about it for quite some time. And the same kinds of thoughts actually apply when you start talking about um, these guys. The artificial intelligences that are going to join us on this world, will it come, whether we will it or not, and I recently published an article saying, you know, look, it, they may come on us by surprise by emergent properties, as is portrayed in Terminator, but it won't be a military program that does this. Because the, if you knew any military officers, you'd know how anal compulsive they are about control and about um, uh, procedure. No, the malignant um, uh, AI, if it emerges, rather than being designed deliberately, the malignant AI is going to come out of the kind of pro-intelligence software that is now getting billions invested in it by people who have the money, and that is high-frequency stock trading programs. Um, the, they are shaving microseconds off the reaction times. All of the stock broker houses in New York are now, have bought up the cheap hotels around this one switching building in New York City so they can be next to it. Um, and these things are designed uh, to have no senses of responsibility or command and control. They are simply predatory. Um, and, and then, of course, there's the notion that we're going to be altering ourselves. And all of these are uh, discussed, in, in, including the Fermi paradox in my new novel, um, and including the, the notion that, um, you know, there's the, the goal. The goal is cool, but getting there is going to be both fun and possibly extremely painful and problematic and require some very sophisticated discussion. Now, um, in this novel also there are other others that come in and these others are in the form of crystalline um, space probes that we are able to get our hands on at last undamaged because we're out in space and this astronaut snags one and it turns out that this is perhaps a more logical way to send messages across the stars than uh, using radio. And in any event, it was certainly worth uh, bringing in as a novel. And it talks about these whole questions of existence, of whether or not um, any aliens out there might survive past the point where they are able to send these things between the stars. 
Um, and these are, in effect, drones. They are the ultimate reification of what we're talking about, and that is the um, emissary that can go and do what you want done because you can't go there. Now, I wanted to um, talk uh, about, before I finish my slideshow, about one um, thing, and that is the notion, since so many of you are into the philosophy of art, uh, and in Sheldon's honor also, I wanted to talk about something that he and I both talked about in a, in a uh, joint talk some years ago at Google, and that is that uh, if you define art as visual, that which visually alters the human soul or mind without persuasion. You look at it and you are altered without having argument go through your mind. Clearly the most powerful works of art of the 20th century were, produ were produced by science, by the nerds, by the engineers, because these two images were the ones that most changed us in our level of maturity, in our thoughtfulness, in our altering our response patterns, in uh, altering where we pay attention. And one is obvious, and it obviously worked. If you had been there in 1946 and talked to wonderful, saintly, brilliant, and on target Lawrence Oppenheimer, and then talked to crazy, mad Hungarian uh, Dr. Strangelove Edward Teller, you would never have imagined which one would be, turn out to have been right. But Saint Bomb saved us. I'm saying this as a man who, who was of the generation who watched several of his friends go off to a lesser war called Vietnam, but who knew that the rhythm of li normal uh, human life would have had every single male member of my generation marching off to a horrific conventional war had it not been for that thing on the left. It's a loathsome thing, and it may still do us in, it may have done in many others, but I think as art, I think it's very important to remember, loathsome or not, what it did to us. As it is important to remember what the object, what the image on the right did, at the end of the most difficult year, any of us who do remember it can remember, you whippersnappers out there do not have a clue what 1968 was like. Any one week would have killed you. Do you remember? Any of you out there? Oh, yes. Any one week. You, you, you aren't men or women enough to be able to take 1968, says the old grouch. Um, at the end of that year, it felt as if we had opened Pandora's box. But the music, the music. At the end of that year, it felt as if we had opened Pandora's box. And there, at the end of that year, was this gem that was delivered to us, the most valuable thing ever given to us by the space program and by the most important of all the Apollo missions, the one that didn't land, Apollo 8, giving us this, which helped to transform the human soul. Now, I want to finish up with a couple of thoughts. Um, uh, I, I, Karen Kaplan said something very, very interesting and very respectworthy about the reevaluation of assumptions. And the inability to reevaluate assumptions and get down to the core where the morality lies rather than having to serve superficialities that are obsolete, uh, I think is very, very important. We are unable to see any of this happening on the American right, unfortunately, while a, while a schizophrenic break is going on. But the left, there's no excuse for not re, re acknowledging certain, uh, re, re evaluating certain things. One is a tendency which is universal on the right but is unfortunately all too common on the left. And that is to believe that acknowledging the existence, palpable existence of real progress undermines the pressure to pursue further progress. This is an underlying assumption that I see again and again and again, seldom parsed out, and it is malignant. The only way that we are going to be able to get progress accelerate is if it is with both the carrot and the stick, both pointing out 
the long road toward betterment that still lies ahead of us and acknowledging that things have happened that are good and relishing them, bragging about them. What, what liberalism is all too often tempted by is the temptation to say, all this has to be done, all this has to be done. Guilt trip, guilt trip, guilt trip. Do this, buy this product. You've been buying it from me for 40 years. It's never worked, buy more. That is insane. Whereas, look at all we've done. Be proud of yourself. You're a can-do people. You, 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 you ripped out of your hearts vile habits that every other generation had of racism, of sexism, of, of cauterizing the possibilities of individuals because of some classification that they're a member of. And we're not done. We're not done by a long shot. We're maybe halfway, but getting us halfway has been marvelous, and you're wonderful. And if the American people were given praise like that by liberals and by the left, there'd be more traction. But what I saw in the meeting yesterday was a bit of a reflex, a reflex that acknowledging that violence has gone down in human civilization, through the good efforts of millions of good people, strokes a nerve that creates automatic rejection on ideological terms. This is a very bad assumption and a very bad habit. It's, 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 it's gelding of the liberal movement. It's self-gelding. And I would include in that also the tent, the tent the tendency to mischaracterize what is involved when we reject people talking about classifications of people. It is not necessary to hate as a discussion possible differences between classifications of people. The objective is to continue the road of removing any possibility that any individual will see their hopes or ability to prove themselves cauterized or limited by virtue of being a member of a classification and therefore because of a stereotype being prejudged. That is the goal. That is where we have made our accomplishments. But oversimplifying this effort by making a general reflex against any discussion of classification when that is one of the most natural human things that human beings do is discussing classifications as discussion items, I believe is a terrible mistake and an assumption that merits re-examination. With that, I will um, pass on to the, some of the other worthy, um, but I'm perfectly happy in the panel section to, be, uh, to, to uh, deal with your questions. Thanks so much. All right. And now for something completely different. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you very much to Ricardo and to Sheldon for inviting me to this. Um, there's so much uh, interesting um, cutting edge interdisciplinary work uh, going on here. I just, it's, it's a marvel to behold. And I think that this is really the model that all of us should be adopting for education, which is to uh, organize around a core strength, but, um, but make sure that, uh, that students get exposure to lots of different angles and ideas. Um, it's a recent article talking about, um, the article was sort, of, it was sort of mixed about Stanford University, but it was saying that, we're, that our goal is to, is to create uh, T-shaped students where they have a lot of breadth and then they go down really far in one particular area. Um, and I wonder if even that is adequate to tackle some of the problems that we are, are facing today and going forward. Um, so anyway, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, I'm not going to use a, a PowerPoint today on the theory that uh, power corrupts, but PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Um, 
So my work involves the immediate commercial prospects of robotics. Um, and so for instance, I co-founded a program at Stanford Law School with the School of Engineering that looks at the legal aspects of autonomous driving. And we got started a while ago, maybe 18 months ago, and uh, lo and behold, Nevada passed the first law allowing autonomous driving in that state. And the, you know, the state legislature uh, said to the DMV, um, I want you guys to promulgate some rules that say, you know, basically uh, that you can drive cars in this state uh, uh, without a driver. Uh, go at it. And the DMV looked around and said, oh my god, we don't know anything about this area, you know? And so then they turned to us and, and we helped them uh, to some extent by providing feedback and input about, about our driverless cars. Um, the first driverless car license, of course, was issued as a, on a test basis to Google not a few, even a few days ago. Um, I also explore the promise and perils of open robotics, which I'll say a little bit more about in a moment. Um, and then finally, I write about privacy uh, in the context of emerging technology. Um, my technical title is that I'm the Director for Privacy and Robotics uh, at the Stanford Center for Internet and Society. Um, drones is an interesting place where those two things arguably uh, and interestingly intersect. Um, so my remarks today, though, might strike you as, as unsophisticated, as, as controversial, uh, possibly both. Um, because my basic claim is that domestic, a domestic drone is far from a, a predator, uh, maybe something of an endangered bird, uh, worthy of further study and, and possibly even of, of protection. Um, by the way, do people, I just something I learned recently is that, uh, did you know that the, like the famous spy, uh, the, maybe the most famous spy, at least in literary history, um, was named after uh, a, a bird watcher? Anybody, people know, Ian Fleming was a, was a huge uh, fan of uh, James Bond, the <laughs> ornithologist, and named that character, character after him. Um, uh, and so my assumption here is going to be that properly de deployed, that drones are actually a net good to society. But we can interrogate that assumption uh, a little bit in the Q&A. Um, and I, I further want to advance uh, th that the law, um, like a drone, is essentially a human instrument. And it has to be directed at uh, pre-legal goals. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, what are our goals around drones? Um, and perhaps our goals around drones are to um, harness their potential benefits domestically while at the same time trying to avoid some of the dangers. Um, so my central point here is that the law has a role, and a very interesting one, in navigating the sort of the, the you know, I think inevitable, um, to some extent, uh, attempt to introduce drones into, into our economy. And so this really is a, a talk about the legal hurdles to the drone economy, if that makes sense, and a very practical one in, this, in one way. Um, so one of the things I consider to be part of my job is to spot when an emerging, emerging technology is going to be transformative, right? Because that's when things get really interesting, at least to me. Um, and sort of you have to ask yourself, like, what are some of the ways to determine whether a particular technology is going to be um, transformative? And I think you have to watch the early adopters. And so you have to watch where DARPA is spending its money. And you had someone here you know, talk about that. Um, you have to watch artists. And so Jordan's performance um, uh, being a, a prime example of that. Um, because actually, today, the folks that are, I think, making the most interesting and widespread use of, uh, of uh, robotics may actually be the military and artists. Um, certainly the case, the case increasingly with, with drones. Um, and then you have to ask yourself, uh, you know, after, after, you know, at least again, if you're trying to figure out what's interesting from a, from a, as a legal scholar, you ask yourself, what is the next transformative technology? And then what are the hurdles to that technology? What is it going to face? Um, what are the conflicts that it creates that are, that are arguably novel in some way? Um, getting the technology right is, of course, an enormous hurdle in the context of drones. Um, it turns out to be very difficult uh, to get something that can stay up for a long time um, uh, because it has to simultaneously be very light and also have a, a power source that lasts over time and these kinds of technologies. Vision and other sensing is, is extremely difficult. Um, one of the hardest things is actually not getting the technology right, but getting the technology cheap. And this has been something that you see in personal servi and service robotics quite a bit. So for instance, there's a wonderful robot out of Willow Garage, which is this uh, innovative um, 
uh, uh, spin-off startup, I guess it's, it's a startup that's been around for years, uh, that builds personal and service robots. And it has this great thing called the PR2, and the PR2, the personal robot 2, can fold laundry and play pool and get you a beer, but it costs $400,000, right? And so we're not going to be doing that. And so they're thinking about ways of, of, how, of driving down that price point. Um, but I think a big hurdle, and for our purposes, uh, uh, one of the most interesting is, is has to do with social acceptance, um, which you know plays out in the legal sphere, of course. Um, and I think uh, of, the, of the three sort of major interesting um, challenges that drones face, um, being incorporated into a meaningful component of our of our society and, and our economy. Um, are, are these. Uh, the first, I think, is actually uh, privacy, then safety, and then intellectual property. So I'll start with privacy. Um, so privacy law, as it reads on the books, actually has surprisingly little to say about drone surveillance. Um, that is to say, there aren't very many laws on the books today that would prevent most of the uses to which you'd put drones in terms of surveillance. So for instance, there's a bunch of cases from the 80s that talk about aerial surveillance um, of, say, someone's backyard or private property, Florida v. Riley. Um, so there's a, there's, there's a, a string of them. And basically what they say is that anywhere where your property is viewable, not just in public, but from a public vantage, um, that it does not trigger the constitutional protections of the Fourth Amendment. And so in one case, uh, uh, officers flew a helicopter over someone's property looking for something, and they spotted marijuana growing uh, through a gap in a greenhouse, and were able to look in there and see that that happened, and, and, uh, you know, we're, and, and we might think to ourselves, we have no idea that that's going to happen, but the court said, look, it's not a search by the police officers because, um, you, know, because uh, you should have expected that, you know, Planes fly around. You know what I mean. You're bad. You should have patched that that hole in the uh, in the uh, greenhouse. Um, and you know, if, if anything, um, if anything, there's a interesting sense in which drone surveillance um, could be more extensive than the surveillance that happens today by manned aircraft. Um, and I'll t so why would that be? Um, there is this interesting sort of subcurrent in the law that says that you have no reasonable ex expectation of privacy in contraband. And the idea is, so a, very, a, a, way, a, good, a good way to illustrate this is the dog sniffing cases, right? And so if you try to bring some marijuana or a bomb or something in a, in a suitcase through the airport, officers don't need to get a warrant for a dog to come over and sniff your bag, it turns out, nor do they need it to sniff your car. Um, another example of this is um, officers don't need a warrant to field test something. So if they come across you and they secure, a, say you drop a bag of, co of what they believe to be cocaine, they, the officers don't need a warrant in order to test the cocaine right there on the spot. And the reason in both instances, and there's other examples of this, but there's the reasons in both instances is that um, the only way that, that it'll be a positive sign, the only way that the dog will alert or the stick will turn blue um, is if there's marijuana or a bomb. And otherwise, the, you know, no officer needs to see the content of your bag. And so similarly with the, uh, the cocaine, it's the only way that thing turns blue is if, uh, is if you have cocaine in there or, or maybe if the, I don't know, the bag's pregnant. But other, other than that, you know, those are the only possibilities. Um, so as applied to drones, I mean, to the extent that drones could fly around and only surface information where um, they detect a pattern of unlawful activity, perhaps they could engage in much more widespread surveillance than an officer could do, right? So for instance, um, even though the Supreme Court has said in the Kylo decision that officers can't look into um, your house or look at your house using thermal imaging, uh, because, and this is, this is paraphrasing one of the justices, uh, the officers might see the hour in which the lady takes her sauna um, and this was like 2000, and this is a relatively recent decision um, with this sort of funny antiquated language. If you're interested, by the way, in the intersection of, of privacy and emerging technology and um, issue, uh, contemporary feminism, there's a great uh, article um, by Jeannie Sook out of Yale called Is Privacy a Woman? I, I recommend it to anybody interested in that topic. Um, but if it were to be done by drones, uh, with it, it, where the drone only ever alerted or only ever showed footage when they found some pattern that could be described as unlawful, would that be okay? 
Um, and students have privacy law, but anyway, the basic point is that privacy law doesn't pose much of a hurdle, it turns out. And students of privacy law will not be surprised by this, and in fact, the law, privacy law generally lags behind uh, technologies of surveillance. One example of this is that uh, we are still using a law from 1986 to govern the circumstances under which the government can get access to your electronic communications like your email, okay? Now think of what was going on in 1986, it was like before Al Gore invented the internet, right? Um, you know, uh, the, 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 the lawmakers' kids uh, were, were switching over from, from Walkman to Discman. And yet that continues to be the law today in which we, in, that, that it governs, it's the electronic communications privacy law. Um, but then the question becomes, does that mean that there's gonna be lots of drones, they mostly used for surveillance, uh, privacy law is not gonna say much about it, um, does that mean that, that they're going to be a net negative for, for privacy? And there's actually lots of reasons to believe that that's not the case. Um, I think that one of the reasons that there is such a disconnect between the state of, of surveillance technology and privacy law is because people lack a mental model of what a privacy violation looks like. I mean, think to yourself, like, what does a contemporary privacy violation look like? It's like two pieces of data are being correlated about you somewhere, maybe in some server, and they're combining together and kicking out some profile, and then suddenly you can't get on a plane. Um, you know, we just don't have a very good uh, mental model for privacy violations in the contemporary age. Um, you know, the way that privacy law moved forward um, at the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century, um, was that by this seminal article by uh, you know, Warren uh, um, and Brandeis called The Right to Privacy, in which the authors um, talked about the change from um, uh, posed photography where you had to wait uh, for someone to take your picture. You had to cooperate with someone taking your picture because you had to be exposed for long periods of time and you couldn't, you know, you know, to s instantaneous or snap photography, which permitted then uh, what they called, you know, yellow journalism where folks could like run into your wedding and take a picture of your daughter's wedding and then splash it up on the front page. And so they said, there's these technological changes and these business practices and we need privacy law. And everybody, I mean, it was, it was narrow cast to the, to, the, to, the side, you know, the people who make decisions to the wealthy and, and the like. Um, but folks who read that had a mental model of what was going on. They said, oh, I see. Used to be I had to, you know, cooperate with surveillance, and now it can happen in a way that I don't anticipate. And, uh, and, and that was actually the catalyst for contemporary privacy law in the United States, many believe. Um, we haven't really had a Warren and Brandeis moment since, I would argue. Um, a good candidate is the drone because everybody has a good mental model of what a drone uh, surveillance looks like. It's this inscrutable, you know, we've been talking about this for, for a couple days, it's this inscrutable metal flying uh, object that is looking at you. Um, we see it, we see the harm, we see the, the we, we, we understand what the violation looks like. Um, even more so, we tend to associate the drone, of course, with the theater of war and more specifically with targeted killing. Um, it's interesting to me to think about the fact that there's been a couple articles talking about how as drones come back from the wars, they're going to be repurposed and that part of this um, pressure on the FAA to relax um, restrictions on, on drones is the fact that all these drones are coming back from the theater of war. Um, we don't have a similar conversation around tanks. You know, when tanks come back from the theater of war, we don't go, Oh, I wonder how we can use those. You know what I mean? And the, and the reason is, but the reason that that drones are so interesting and useful is simultaneously they are this deeply used, you know, military technology. But also they have these these applications. But they also carry that military baggage when they're redeployed. Um, so there could be a weird, interesting sense in which the domestic use of drones forces us to re-examine. Uh, our privacy law and, and, and the balance that we've struck between privacy and competing values. Um, because, because people will freak out uh, where, when drones are flying around. Um, and so we may re-examine this notion that uh, we have no privacy when we're in a public space or viewable from a public vantage, or that we have no privacy in contraband. Um, that is not the law of Canada, for instance. Uh, they struck a different balance. And so, um, you know, it, 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 there could be a way in which the drone could be a, an interesting, uh, healthy addition uh, uh, to, to uh, emerging technology, in, just in the sense that it requires to re-examine those things. Um, 
I also, but also sort of in defense of the drone, then as I begin, is that we have to get this privacy issue right or people won't tolerate the use of drones, I don't think, right? And so that's why I've been part of a group of people urging the Federal Aviation Administration to take, to take not just safety but also privacy into account as drones get developed. I'm not doing that just to be anti-drone. I'm doing it because I believe that if the FAA doesn't, doesn't get the privacy, um, puts privacy safeguards in place, that um, people will, again, there'll be a big reaction to them, they won't be deployed widely. Um, the second issue I want to talk about, and the second sort of hurdle to the drone economy, is safety. Um, this has a well understood administrative law dimension um, that was covered in detail yesterday, and so I, 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 I'll just refer to Mike's comments, but I mean, um, the basic idea is that that's what the FAA is concerned about. The FAA is primarily concerned about safety, and they're taking a lot of interventions in that. Um, space. A, a sort of less, a less well understood dimension to safety with drones is actually um, product liability. Um, and this is where the notion of open robotics comes in. So let me see if I can explain this succinctly. Um, the personal computer was so useful because you could buy one and then you could buy the software from some third party. Apple didn't have to come up with all the possible software applications. So when you bought a PC, and there's this great book by Jonathan Dittrain called The Future of the Internet that actually goes into this in, in detail. But when you bought a personal computer, um, you bought it not for what it could do at the moment that you bought it. Um, but in addition, you bought it for all the things it might do when third parties contributed to it. And that's how we got you know, spreadsheets and everything else, even the connection to the Internet. Um, all it really had to do is, was pass what I call the neighbor test, right? So your neighbor comes over and says, why the hell did you buy that computer? You got to have like one answer to that person saying, "Well, I, you know, because I wanted to organize my receipts," uh, and that's probably enough for your neighbor to say, "Oh, that makes sense." But really, what you bought it for was all the other stuff it might do down the line. Um, it creates a much more interesting and um, innovation ecosystem to have an open platform um, with 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 personal computers because, again, the the manufacturer can focus on the hardware, and then lots of other people can write the software if that makes sense. Um, and with the personal computer, there were early cases in which uh, uh, people lost data, important data, and they sued, and they were laughed out of court. The courts were very quick uh, in the early computer cases to dismiss or cabin liability, um, when and partly on the, on the notion that um, it's just really complicated. We don't, it's really difficult to unpack whether the glitch that happened was a function of the software, was it the operating system if so, was it the hardware, was it something you, the user, did that you shouldn't have been doing. Uh, and so basically their position was, look, these things are, are glitchy. And they used a very specific doctrine for the most part called the economic loss doctrine that um, basically limits your liability to the um, price of the hardware or software and not the lost you know, um, economic value that you might have had or the lost time you might have had because it lost your term paper or threw out a, uh, an important um, uh, document. Okay, so fast forward to, um, but an important limitation of the economic loss doctrine, I, could, I should say, is that uh, it only counts if what you've lost is not, does, is not tangible. It's not you know, basically um, getting hurt, property damage, or getting physically hurt, not covered by the econ economic loss doctrine. So fast forward to drones. The best, fastest way for drone innovation to occur is for there to be drone platforms that have no dedicated purpose. They're just open. And then for lots of people to collaborate around the operating system, around the software, for lots of different people to write apps for robots the way that you write apps for mobile um, phones. That's the way we're going to sell a lot of these things quickly. That's the way we're going to advance the state of technology, I believe. Um, you know, it's easy to do liability with a closed system. So one example is the Roomba. Everyone's familiar with the Roomba vacuum cleaner, right? So the Roomba's supposed to do one thing and it's supposed to do one thing well. It's supposed to vacuum your floor. It's supposed to do one thing safely. If there was this one, there was this case in Israel where um, a Roomba sucked up a poisonous snake, and it was hailed as uh, Roomba robot hero saved fa family from poisonous snake, right? But God forbid, instead of a poison, you know, poisonous snake, what had been sucked up was a pet's tail. You know who to blame. Why? Because the Roomba does one thing, 
and the same company makes the hardware, makes or licenses the software, and so on. Compare that to an open platform, including a drone, though. Um, so the iRobot, which makes the Roomba, also made another device uh, that, because so many people were hacking the Roomba and trying to make it do cool stuff that you know it wasn't built to do, that iRobot created made something called the Create, which was a platform that did not vacuum. It was just an open platform using a lot of the same tools um, as as the Roomba. Um, and in Austin, Texas, people took that thing and said, "Oh, neat!" And then does everybody here know the the game uh, Frogger? Remember that game Frogger? Yeah. So I'm seeing a lot of heads. Basically, the the the, um, the game Frogger is one where uh, a frog this poor frog has to like cross the street um, and there's like, or, or various other, like a river and there's various things like alligators and logs and or cars in the, in the case of the street trying to run into the, into the frog and the frog has to sort of figure out how to get across. It's an old Atari game, I think. Um, these people decided that they would throw a fuzzy uh, green suit on the Create and have it play Frogger in real life. Okay? And that's possible because, you know, hey, I don't know. And so can iRobot possibly foresee uh, that, uh, that the people are going to do this with the iRobot? No, because they don't know what its dedicated purpose are. Um, to purposes are. They d built it to do anything. Um, were they running iRobot software? Absolutely not. They wrote their own software. They borrowed software some, from, some third, from some third party to do the uh, to teller operation in this case. Um, the, the basic point is that it creates, I think, really difficult um, legal liability issues to have an open platform. And the same is true and perhaps even more true in the context of drones. You know, these are open robotic platforms that people will be able to write apps. You already have that with, with this with the Parrot AR drone, which is a $300 drone that you can buy in a toy store. And you can um, uh, fly it around with your iPhone and it has, an AP, it, you know, it has an API, which means that you can actually write apps for it. And that I think is the, is the future of robotics, the immediate commercial uh, future of robotics is this sort of apps for robots model. Um, in fact, I advise a, um, uh, a company called the Robot App Store, and it's an app store for robots, and you can buy apps for all kinds of different robot things. Um, but it does create this very difficult problem where uh, when anything goes wrong, there's going to be lots of people to sue. And in fact, the danger is that manufacturers of open robotic platforms will get sued every time someone does something stupid um, with a robot. Someone runs over uh, or swerves to avoid the uh, Frogger uh, create, um, they're going to sue, among other people, uh, iRobot because of its deep, deep pockets. Um, my solution, by the way, to this, I don't know, is, is uh, it, it, I have a paper on this su subject called Open Robotics, and my solution that I argue for is that we should have, like, we should immunize the manufacturers of open robotic platforms like drones um, for what users do with them in the same way that we immunize Facebook for what people post on Facebook. Right, because you know, on Facebook, if I you know if I defame Ricardo, like it, he can't sue Facebook, he's got to sue um, me, and that's because of a of a federal law, the Communications Decency Act, that requires it. Um, okay, one one last issue I'll point out, and then I'll I'll stop there for for time considerations, um, is intellectual property, and so. You know, we've reached this absurd, in my view, absurd state of affairs right now, where all the big technology companies own a bunch of patents they don't even need. Um, technically speaking, and they do so because that way if somebody sues them, they can countersue because everybody's using everybody else's proprietary, um, you know, allegedly proprietary software and, and hardware. Um, the whole industry, the internet industry, was built on a certain number of, of patents that everybody kind of uses, and then they sue one another about it. Um, it's, it's, an, it's, a t it's essentially a tax on innovation that, 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 that the patent law has, has delivered up in the context, I think, of software, at least. Um, robotics can't go forward because of the technical challenges that I mentioned. Um, robotics cannot go forward, including drone technology, in a very serious way without some sharing. Does that make sense? Like, you know, you make a really great vision system, I make a really great whatever. And we, you know, get together and we, and we share this stuff and I build them up on, on what you make. That's how driverless cars have come so far is because of the DARPA Grand Challenge where you know, just one, one quick aside about the DARPA Grand Challenge. In the, in the first DARPA Grand Challenge, when none of the um, autonomous vehicles were, in, in, were actually able to navigate this, uh, uh, this uh, desert um, uh, run that they had in, in Nevada, um, there was this guy who decided, you know, look, I, I make, um, I think he made refrigerators. And he was like, I make refrigerators, but you know what? 
I'm going to make an autonomous vehicle, and I'm going to compete in this DARPA Grand Challenge, okay? And then, so this guy built this autonomous vehicle, and it was just terrible. I mean, it didn't do anything, because he didn't have any formal training in, in any of these things. So he made this thing, and it wasn't very good. However, it did have one really good component of it. It had this really great laser um, rangefinder on it that after the first competition, everybody, including the most sophisticated players, Stanford, Berkeley, uh, and the like, uh, Carnegie Mellon, looked at that and said, wow, that's, that's really amazing, that one little thing that you made. And, and then by the next year, everybody was using that same technology, and that thereby really advanced. And then they also used whatever the state-of-the-art algorithms were, whatever the state-of-the-art GPS happened to be. Um, I don't think robotics is going to be able to go forward without some sharing. Another quick cautionary tale. Um, do people know like the, Ibo do the Sony Ibo dog, that robotic dog, right? So when Ibo first came out, um, it only had a couple of software programs you could write for the iBo. This is this little robotic dog, and it would do like two sets of things. Like one of, one of the software programs was one where it would sort of grow up. It would go from puppy behavior to more mature behavior, I guess, uh, dog behavior. Um, and the other piece of software was to allow it to recognize certain kinds of voice commands. Uh, maybe, I think about 100 voice commands. And they were, the, both of these softwares were released by, by Sony. So what happened was that people bought this robotic dog and they figured out that they could hack into it and they could, give it, they could get it to do all kinds of amazing behaviors that it was not initially supposed to be able to do. Um, and not only could they get the, the, the robotic dog to do a bunch of things that were not part of the initial software offering, they were able to um, package that um, creation up and share it with other people. So what happened were that these, these internet um, uh, chat, you know, basically sharing sites like Iboware sprung up and people would just be like, you know, I got my dog to sing to Madonna, you know, here you go, you can do that too. And people were able to grab each other's software basically um, and share it and then cause, basically cause the, um, the um, robot to do all kinds of interesting stuff. So what did Sony do? Rather than sit there and go, wow, people are innovating on our product and making it much more useful than it had been before. They actually sued uh, all the people who were sharing software for copyright violations, and they ended up shutting down Iboware, which was the most popular uh, place where this stuff was where this stuff was shared. Um, according to many people, uh, this led to uh, the discontinuing of the Ibo um, line because of the consumer backlash that occurred. Later on, Sony opened the Ibo back up and said, "Okay, fine, anybody can write for it." And now, even today, there is a national there is an international Ibo conference and. Um, Ibo was used uh, for the robo, um, the soccer tournament, uh, among other things. Um, so sharing, I think, is essential. But on the other hand, intellectual property has a real role to play in incentivizing knowledge creation. Because why, otherwise, everyone free rides, right? So why would you bother to spend a lot of money creating a really good, uh, say, competitor to the Roomba uh, that uses lasers instead of um, instead of uh, just you know, dumbly um, sort of bumping into the wall, um, as, as Nito has done, uh, if then everybody else could just copy you, and that's the end of the story. And so there's this real tension between the need to preserve incentives for innovation uh, and the need to share. And in fact, I'm convening a bunch of um, uh, uh, sort of heavy hitters in intellectual property law with a bunch of burgeoning uh, robotics startups to so see if we can do a little bit of a better job uh, than, than um, uh, than was done with the software industry. Anyway, I'll stop on that note, and I really appreciate uh, your time. Quite a bit. Yeah, like everybody else, so let me just just give a genuine th a thank you to Ricardo and to Jordan and to Sheldon for organizing such a wonderful conference and for bringing us all together. And I'd really also like to thank all the women who work behind the scenes, working on the tables, working on travel. We're really just so solicitous and so helpful. You know, just it's created a great intellectual event um, for everyone. I think so. It's great. So the talk I like to give today, as soon as I get this situated, is called After the Drones. And it goes something like this. I'd like to speak today about the moral psychogeography of drones 
In his really wonderful book called Gray Ecology, Paul Virilio argued that the, in the age of technology, what Heidegger called in the age of, might have called in the age of completed technology, its final ineluctable aesthetic stage moves technology from perversity to psychosis, a purely hallucinatory reality which circuits languages of power and desire and fear and fascination. So I'd just like to reflect today a little bit on the notion of the drone as a symptomatic hallucinatory sign of a reality that bears, I believe, the tangible scent of a larger cultural politics which carries within it a deeper pathology. So then I ask myself, but which kind of mass hallucination is perhaps signified by the drone, and particularly, particularly by the notion of militarized drones? Is drones signs of panic times? In this case, I believe that if the dronal power can bring strategies of visualization into such sharp focus, it's perhaps because the real circuits of power today have gone underground and have become really fundamentally undetectable. I think of the bitterness of an angry heart or the palpable desire for revenge of those who Judith Butler has described and Lisa described as this morning have been rendered vulnerable and precarious in detail in the games of imperial power or the airsets culture of injury on the part of the Tea Party, or the anxiety of the failing middle class, or just as we discussed this morning, our panic times of the drone warfare in response to the just war of technological liberalism, which from my perspective seems to be substituting scenes of sacrificial violence abroad for invisible but very real lack of analysis of the political economy, the crisis of political economy at home. Or on the other hand, is the emergence of the drone so much part of the contemporary psychogeography, the contemporary imagination, perhaps a sign of something else? Is it perhaps a sign of cynic heightened cynicism? Drones, in this case, would be palpable signs of a purely delirious reality. Consider, for example, the illusion of absolute precision to mask what's been made absolutely evident at this conference, the reality of chaotic violence. Like everything else, the moral ecology of drones is, I believe, caught up in a larger drift of politics and culture between the moral perversity of supposedly sanitized violence and the cultural psychosis of cultures that move between profound boredom and overstressed subjectivities. In terms of its symbolic visual imagery, the imagery of the spectacle of the drone is precisely that. It moves between interminable waiting, interminable waiting on a hovering cycle, interspersed with chaotic of sudden hellfire violence. And it strikes me that it's really an effective visual symbol of what's happened to contemporary subjectivity, which itself seems to move between an Archimedean garden of profound boredom and sometimes spasms of murderous desires for entertainment, desires for violence, and whatnot. So I'd like to just give this talk called After the Drones, which consists of several stories. And I'd like to start with a story called Drone Wars, which is a reprise and story which also circulates in the contemporary imagination. It's been discussed at this conference already, and I'd just like to reflect on it a bit further. And of course, I have a local autobiographical reason for paying attention to the stories. It takes place in North Dakota, and of course, I was born in Winnipeg, I've taught in Winnipeg, just literally miles from this, and the story took me by surprise. I was thinking to myself when I read this story, what do six stray cows and one MQ Predator B drone and a taser gun have in common? In North Dakota these days, it seems quite a lot. There's a story on the wires recently, which many of us have followed. It went like this. A predator drone, the same aerial vehicle used by the CIA to track down and assassinate terrorists and militants in Pakistan, Afghanistan, was used to hunt down the Brossards, a North Dakota family who allegedly wouldn't give back three cows and their calves that wandered onto their farm. Now, the Brossards are the first known American citizens subjected to predator drones that the, predator, that the federal government has now made available to some local sheriffs and police chiefs all without congressional approval, as far as I can see, or search warrants. Now, local officials know the Brossards are known and recognized for being armed. They're anti-government separatists. They claim that their sprawling farm is used as a compound. 
So when Sheriff Janke visited the farm, he was met by armed resistance on the part of an armed father, a daughter who physically attacked him. So confronted by armed resistance, the sheriff immediately summoned a 154 million MQ Predator B-9 drone from the nearby Grand Forks Air Force Base, where it was patrolling the U.S.-Canada border for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. As a happy conclusion. Police recovered the cattle valued at $6,000. They arrested the family matriarch, the daughter, and the father as well, and the three sons. The family now faces several felony charges. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection agents fly eight Predator remote-controlled aircraft to patrol the American borders with Canada and Mexico, searching for smugglers and illegal immigrants. And who knows? Maybe these predator drones are on the U.S.-Canadian border, perhaps to stop citizens of this great republic from actually fleeing to Canada for free health care. So was this one of the first identified sightings of the coming drone wars against stray cows and angry farmers on the 21st century American frontier, or is it something else? Perhaps this isn't just a story about cows and drones and a besieged farm family, but something more deeply symptomological. With a recent ruling by the FAA that drones in the skies of America are now authorized, we're suddenly brought face to face with the theater of what I would call delirious technology. In this case, it's no longer drone technology, it's something relentlessly functional. Functional as a spearhead or the war machine against Afghan insurgents. Nor drone technology is simply invasive. Invasive of territorial integrity, national sovereignty, distinctions based on proportionality response, overriding due process, invasive of traditional notions of privacy, even nullifying prohibitions against assassination, all functional instrumental uses for drones. But perhaps drone technology is a quintessential sign of technology itself moving at such accelerated speeds and with such augmented spatial reach that it actually stops functioning as a technology in any recognizable sense of the term becomes something purely aesthetic, something purely delirious. Reaper drones stalking lonely cows in the American frontier. Predator drones parked in the urban sky trying to get a glimpse of the local neighborhood criminal of the day. Drones shaped like bats and birds and spiders or hummingbirds, or perhaps even like visual simulacra of the American eagle invading the night sky, probably colliding into each, in the, each other in the day sky of our cities with eyes that see but probably can never feel the anger of a raging heart with automatic vision that understands with, but understanding that approaches zero degree, representing in fact a big step up in unmanned perception, but an equally large downgrade in attenuated human awareness. And always in the background, there's the very same technological ideology at work, namely that while new technologies are originally welcomed and feverishly welcomed for what they facilitate, Better communication, global consciousness, enhanced connectivity, augmented freedom, upgraded perception, augmented data memory. Every technology inevitably culminates as a technology of control when the bill for the feast of big data is delivered to already docile populations. That's the logic, at least, behind the apparent disproportionality of this story about the deployment of a $154 million predator drone to teach a lesson in the games of drone power to a recalcitrant American farm family who obviously hadn't got the message that today no strays are allowed where there are six cows or six humans in the new security state. So with this story in mind, I think about the future. It might well be to consider whether in the future, like the great reference of power and consciousness and sex and truth before it, the drones also might be entering the age of heightened cynicism. While robotic futurism has often been framed in advance by Isaac Asimov's essentially Kantian philosophical injunction that our robotic offspring should do no harm to their human inventors, or by Bruce Sterling's beautifully crafted apocalyptic vision in Crystal Express of a terminal post-enlightenment struggle between machinists on the one hand and expressivists on the other, which is, of course, a replay of what Hegel said earlier when Hegel said we should think of the struggle between reason and passion in robotic form. It might just be, it might just be that robots, 
probably caught up in a sudden enthusiasm for fictional philosophy and sci-fi and technological inscriptions of cinema and television shows had themselves these days been thumbing through the pages of the very latest in post-human literature, paying particular attention to Nietzsche's prophecies that a day will come when power itself will become purely perspectival. Power will not be so much about desires for totality and control and hegemony, but like everybody else, with the fury, it'll be interested in the furies and caprices of fate with the return of mythology, with stories of sudden reversal, tales of capricious fortune, with the possibility that the of the introduction, excuse me, with the possibility that the introduction into their own cybernetic systems of a barest minimum of undecidability and uncertainty and unpredictability will make the already interminable life of a drone fascinating and interesting once more. I believe that when drones come to town, and drones are coming to town, not just rational thinking drones produced by the high priests of artificial intelligence in their own image, but drones packed with affectivity, drones that feel and come alive, drones with the affect of the street cultures of the sky, those future drones will almost certainly come to town under the delirious sign of cynical robots. So then I'd like to talk about a second story, Bodies That Matter. It begins again with a story that was so beautifully told by Lisa this morning of a terrible events in Afghanistan and Pakistan. You remember, there was a disturbing report in The Guardian about the CIA use of Reaper and Predator drones in the northwest provinces of Afghanistan. Since assassinations are illegal, the usual war of drones in Afghanistan has been shifted, rhetorically at least, towards targeted enemies, al-Qaeda suspects, Pashtun resistance leaders, guerrilla fighters. Recently, however, the strategy of targeted strikes has been seemingly eclipsed by a new use of predator drones directed against groups of Afghan civilians gathered together for funeral orations, for funeral orations. Sometimes fighters, of course, but you know, really more typically, like in towns where I come from, when funerals are attended, they're attended by women in Afghanistan, certainly many, many children, and certainly many elderly Afghans. Now this linking through violence of funeral orations in the small villages in the mountain towns in Afghanistan, which of course has a real proximity to where I speak from today, this linking through violence of funeral orations in Afghanistan and sophisticated missile firing drones produced in California is one of those elemental ethical struggles that I think signals really the beginning of the 21st century and the end of the 20th century, which we believe will be marked, which I believe will be marked by a mostly invisible but always violent struggle on a global basis between what Judith Butler has described as bodies that matter and what I would describe following this as bodies that don't matter. In the complex ways of most things, this sidereal flow of consequential violence as it circulates among hovering drones in the Afghan sky, bodies that don't matter on the ground, and funeral orations represents, I believe, a fundamental rupture in the ethical order of things. Now, in his recent really important, beautifully written, but chilling text called Terror from the Air, the German theorist Peter Sloterdijk has written a series of eloquent reflections on the nature of warfare in the 20th century. In Sloterdijk's estimation, it's possible to actually pinpoint the beginning of the 20th century in the sudden use of clouds of poisonous gas against British and Canadian soldiers on the battlefields of Belgium. For Sloterdijk, for Sloterdijk at this warfare, at this point, warfare ceased to be a violent clash of power against power using mechanical weaponry, and it became something else. It became something profoundly environmental, literally setting the air on fire with gaseous compounds as a way of staving off inevitable defeat. Now, since that epical moment that in Sloterdijk's terms began the 20th century, the hijacking of the four humors of classical antiquity air, earth, fire, and water, as weapons of global warfare, has been normalized as the violent horizon of modern weaponry. 
from the blasts of radioactivity at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the deliberate and viciously experimental firebombing of Dresden and Tokyo, the defoliation of Vietnam using Agent Orange, to what Heidegger might have described as the framing of the contemporary world picture by the shock and awe techniques of the recent Iraqi war. Well, we have perhaps become mentally and perhaps ethically habituated to the violent sequestration of entire environments as violent war ecologies, as ways of creating docile populations. It would seem that the action of drones in Afghanistan should gain some purchase on our attention, should become eth proximate to our ethical consciousness, since it, believes, it represents, I believe, a shift beyond the macro warfare with and against whole environments of air, earth, fire, and water to something else to a microphysics of violence clearly premised on a moral calculus concerning which bodies matter and which bodies don't matter in these persistently violent times. Now you know, inhabitants of a technological universe, pilgrims along the way, we are just surrounded daily by chamber of commerce type boosterism for the increasingly sterile if not cynical claims of cybernetic reason from business schools with their manifestos about big data and the digital humanities with its positivistic proclamations in favor of distant reading to Google's utopia of a life not so much lived as an archived fetal procession of events that's Google's timeline. The hegemony of cybernetic reason is everywhere. So it should come as no surprise that war drones, this most cybernetic of all spearheads for the global distribution and maintenance of imperial power should be invested with a, claim, a distinct claim to originality in the ethical domain. Drones in Afghanistan and Somalia and Yemen, in Yemen and in the Seychelles now, and who can really be certain about where later, are in the first instance, instances, instance, technical manifestations of what I would describe as distant ethics. Here there's not only a clear separation between cybernetic control of information and I think, of course, as Peter went through so eloquently today, of those video pilots can targeting, target, controlling target acquisition commands on air bases in Arizona, and then going to their suburban homes as technological casualties of the war. But also dissident ethics, because with almost mythic force, political leadership itself has now literally distanced itself from the earthly consequences of their actions except in the purely specular role of emotionally invested viewers of the worldwide television that is military man command and control today. If the two main ideologies of this contemporary day are technological liberalism and redemptive conservatism, perhaps what they share deeply in common when it comes to power is a coeval commitment to distant ethics as a precondition of the global distribution of power. And they share it not reluctantly, but really deeply, seductively, enthusiastically. While well, distant ethics is based on a clear separation between action and consequence, whereby only a coded telematic signal intervenes to initiate the execution phase of the drone attack, if those media glimpses of the faces of our shared political leadership is any measure, there is very real cathartic pleasure to be found in visuals of sacrificial violence. Here for myself at least, we are finally brought into the presence of scenes of sacrificial blood flowing from bodies that do not matter, fully entangled with the dissonant ethics of cybernetic intelligence. And while all the blowback for all this lurks in the background like an almost invisible but very detectable trace of the hauntological, as the historian Chalmers Johnson has written, what he calls the sorrow of empire is always more deeply mythological than imminently political in nature. Specifically that the furies of nemesis inevitably will follow the hubris of power. Or in the case of predatory, predator and reaper drones, cybernetics today not only has an ontology, but drones and cybernetic drones have a hauntology that will soon, I suspect, be the distinguishing feature of 21st century existence. 
And for that matter, not just living bodies that do not matter, but the targeting of dead bodies as well. They don't matter. Politically, this indicates that cynical powers eclipse the distinction itself between death and life, restaging both in terms of a greater calculus of imperial violence. Following the writings of Emil Durkheim on the social rituals associated with mourning, we can recognize that the importance of mourning does not simply address grief over the death of a particular individual, whether based on kinship or friendship, but mourning the act of grief has a deeper and larger social function, namely that the rituals associated with the act of mourning, the collective rituals serve to reintegrate, reintegrate the grieving spirit of the mourner into the continuity of life of the community. So when I think back to those images of the actual deliberate targeting of funeral rations, I think that in targeting the bodies of the innocent, mourners gathered for a funeral in small and isolated and vulnerable and precarious communities of Afghanistan, what is accomplished is not only terror from the air, as slaughtered at clans, but something else. What is accomplished is a death of community with its consequent impossibility of reintegrating mourners through ritualistic appeals to the healing powers of life. What is rehearsed through the violent power of predator and reaper drones is in effect the power of death over life itself. For those disavowed, excluded, and prohibited, for that is, bodies that don't matter, what is enforced today is actually a double ethical refusal. First, a refusal to honor the dead and then secondly, a refusal to honor the possibility of the power of life itself through mourning. Refuse both death and life. Bodies that do not matter are thus ethically marginalized to the space of the in-between, to the liminal, to be the prohibited, excluded, and disavowed subjects existing in really a new space, in a nameless space, in a nowhere space that is between life and death itself. It's really little wonder for me that lawyers for the ACLU have argued that with drone attacks, literally the entire world has now become a battlefield. So just a final point to complete the circuit of violence set in motion by drone warfare. While its basic condition of possibility is purely technological, the drone is a cybernetic assemblage linking aerial hovering motion and visual surveillance and rapid communication. And while its moral possibility is premised on distant ethics directed against bodies that do not matter, that are increasingly the majority of the global population when the world itself is now re reconceived as a battleground, its lasting consequence, I believe, will be hauntological. Already nations involved in the new military alliance of imperial power sense, palpably sense, the presence of the specter of the hauntological. Fear of revenge attacks in direct proportion to the lack of moral accountability for this deadly mixture of dissonant ethics and bodies that don't matter and cybernetic drones is surely the animating psychological fuel motivating the growth of the new security state with its augmented surveillance technologies, bunkering of the border, and severe restrictions on the mobility of nomadic world populations. While well, the gaze of surveillance can never detect the presence of an angry heart or the bitterness of subjects following capricious and unjustified violence, it's equally the case that fear of revenge and heightened anxiety over attempted retribution by bodies that don't matter enter a harsh note of repression into the subjectivity of the domestic populations of imperial power. The specter of revenge and the prospect of future blowback are in effect the animating affect that motivates the drift of contemporary politics to the right. Ironically, the more illusionary the possibility of revenge, the more intense, I believe, the psychological counterreaction of the domestic population. And if I could be printed, I just have one concluding story to tell. I tell a story now about after the drones. When the final extinction event has taken place, and on that lonely morning, when that lonely morning finally comes, when the sun rises on a planet of the dead and the dying, and cities of the vanquished and the disappeared, I believe the only visible motion left will be purely prosthetic. The aimless flapping of wings by vulture robots still circling in the sky 
on an indefinite hovering cycle. The only nighttime movement, the furtive flights of virtual bats with their beautiful memory-shaped alloys and miniature specks of artificial intelligence, and the only sounds those of the remaining virtual hornets or swarms of robotic bees, or perhaps by that time, spectral flights of dragons fashioned in some long-forgotten and now abandoned Stanford robotic research lab by a graduate student in software engineering who, following the literary footsteps of all the great futurists of what was then the human world of Philip K. Dick and Neil Stevenson and Raymond Gallen, read Games of Thrones with such feverish intensity that his mind immediately generated its own robotic offspring in the form of perfect simulacra, flying dragons, indefinitely nuclear-powered. The bones of the last of the humans may have gone to the burial sites, but surely their residues will remain in the form of the lingering mechanics of clones and drones and androids and virtual zombies. And on that day, I wonder who the, I wonder what the real survivors of the extinction event, bats and rats and beetles and cockroaches and eagles and vultures and hornets will have to say. When a turkey vulture looks a virtual vulture in the eye, will it feel technological envy at its prosthetic finery or only a sense of shame that it has to share the daytime sky with robotic pretenders on a terminal doomsday flight to a, cyber, to a final cybernetic spasm when the virtual vulture eventually crashed to Earth for lack of power? And what will real swarms of truly angry hornets make of their own simulacra? Will they turn on them in predatory fashion, mocking their sudden defensiveness, or will they simply swarm on by like hornet-like with hornet-like indifference? And what stories would Japanese samurais have to tell about their virtual descendants in the form of the Lockheed Samurai Mav drone? And what memories biblical will crack open the earth and will open the graves of the dead when they hear the war machine robots called Old Testament names like Reaper or the Predator circle the earth in one last search for the Messiah that never comes? Once the human shield of technology has been revealed, has been removed, I wonder how long a micro bat will last, a virtual worm will squirm, a turkey vulture will hover, an army of simulated ants will continue to dig, or a human clone, for that matter, will continue to drone. In his essay, The Question Concerning Technology, Martin Heidegger, I believe, was both right and wrong. He was certainly correct in noting that human identity has been so deeply shaped by being swept along in a larger, ineluctable technological destiny not of its own making, and certainly outside its full comprehension. But I believe that Heidegger was wrong in not noting as well that the destiny of technology is also deeply enmeshed in the mysterious ways of that singularity, that beautiful singularity that we call a human being. Like human identity before it, technological identity is also swept along at a human destiny not of its own making, and certainly invisible to its full understanding. And just as humans came into their essence with an understanding of technology, so too the future of technology may only come into its full essence with an understanding of human ineluctability. After the drones is, I believe, a going to be a strange world of strange symmetries and strange symbiotics, a world filled with drone flesh. Heidegger again. In his letter on humanism, Heidegger argued that the epoch of the human began with what he called are coming into subjectivity, that we would be vibrant beings invested with a sense of the technological mastery of nature. We would be guaranteed biblically by the word of God herself to be on top of the huddle in the hierarchy of species. We would be beings who, as Nietzsche said, would finally catch the interests of the otherwise jaded gods of pagan times because humans were a gamble, a crossing over, content absolutely content and strong enough to live with nausea over their own existence, as long as they continue to be a creative drive to a future, a shaper of worlds, a will to power, a will to will, a will to technology, and nothing besides. So if this is the case, perhaps now we can write an epilogue to Heidegger's letter on humanism in the form of text messages about the post-human that point where something equally epical is now taking place, where the post-human body literally shapeshifts out of the old body of the human with this now discarded subjectivity and takes on the virtual form of drone flesh. Not a human being now coming into subjectivity, 
but something else is happening. A post-human being is coming into trans-subjectivity. Like post-human culture, drone flesh is absolutely present everywhere today. We are being like a drone, thinking like an algorithm, seeing computationally. We're packed with technology. We're volatilized by the kinetic energy of connectivity. We slump into inertia when kept on our waiting cycle. So I believe that if drones can be so fascinating and endlessly seductive, both for their engineering feats of the technological sublime and their truly doubled nature as beautiful specters and ominous skin slayers, that's because their appearance only confirms a subtle, but for that matter, no less dramatic change that has already taken place. Namely, that long before there were drones in the sky, in the water, in the fire, in the earth, there were already imaginary drones at home. Drones that long ago nested in the technological skin of the post-human. Drone dreams that took to the flesh of the very first of the post-human, burrowing deeply into the bodies and minds and feelings of a once and future population of trans subjects. In the way of all mythic stories, technology always comes late to the feast. Long before the technicity of unmanned perception, augmented intelligence and robotic flight, the post-human imaginary has already unraveled the illusion of the real, of the technological real in advance. This is what makes contemporary post-human culture so tough and absolutely adaptable. It is prepared as a form of trans-subjectivity, as a form of dronal flesh, to actually do that which has never been done before. It is prepared to serve as its own condition of possibility. It is prepared to daily cross the abyss of boredom and tedium and nausea and pleasure with its pit of seeing like an algorithm and thinking computationally and packed with technology or coming alive at the sounds and sight of greater connectivity. It's prepared to do all these things as long and as only as long as it can be a will, a technological creator of its destiny and nothing besides. Trans subjects, in fact, have always demonstrated an enduring willingness, willingness to live with the dangers of technology, not so much to experience the saving power of technology, as Heidegger's claims, but to do something more interesting, namely to live in the fractured, liminal, and unpredictable space between the danger and the saving power. And I'll conclude. This is, I believe, what is most appealing about drone technology is its fatal incommensurability. It's truly dangerous. And at the same time, it may even be a saving power. But in the end, it's neither one nor the other. It's both at the same time. And it's precisely because it introduces a fatal, what John Baudrillard calls, a fatal enigmatic tension into existence that we can find ourselves, finally, excuse me, that we can finally find ourselves truly comfortable and fundamentally disturbed with the prospect of being wrapped in the screen of drone flesh, sometimes on the outside, but now always deepest in our interior dronal imaginations. Thank you very much. So um, you guys are doing great on your durational uh, dronal state, surviving, uh, and like good uh, durational performance artist, you just have to move on in your timetable a little bit more till coffee time. Um, so one of the the elements of this, uh, you know, kind of transversal uh, landscape of dialogue that the panel. Um, uh, both accidentally and fully conscious of it brought together um, is this sense of um, both uh, a biopolitics of death uh, guaranteed and amplified uh, by the general intellect of uh, dronology yet at the same time uh, a biopolitics of affirmation of uh, impossible possibilities that allow us to sense uh, something other than what we are uh, towards uh, positions that 
uh, in one way in David's talk will offer us a, a horizontal singularity uh, where we can uh, share multiple gazes uh, into the realities around us uh, and look at the opacities of power and shift it otherwise. Um, in terms of the economics that are uh, functioning to uh, limit the possibilities of robotics in the moment and as it's rolled out in the pragmatics of the FAA. Um, the questions that um, the law brings to it in, in terms of um, Ryan's breakdown is that uh, we are at a point of blockage uh, a blockage which uh, has solutions, again, at this uh, horizontal level of shareability, uh, but yet is uh, to be worked out through the strictures of the law in process. And so, uh, to a certain degree, the, the law of dronology then is one in which the techniques that can be mobilized are um, in a certain sense uh, vertical. That is vertical in the acceptance by certain conditions of production of the market to the acceptance of these alter economies of distribution shareability which allow things to manifest themselves otherwise. And so that the law has to switch code between what is allowable in the probabilities of the impossible and what is not allowable based on impossible possibilities. Um, and then finally, I, I think with the, the kind of ontology uh, that um, Arthur brings to, uh, uh, to the tense point in, in which the, the very conditions of that possible impossibility and that possible impossibility of existing at a site of the after, that indeed we are always already after effects, effects, um, that dronology is not a marker of our present future, but of our future past, um, in that we are indeed um, dancing on the grass-lined abyss into which the, all the children and dogs are thrown into as drones are working in the urban design and creating the new parks that are present for us now. So that these tales of ontology then are uh, also marking a, a space of ecology and economics uh, at the very level of the sense of the body its somatic architecture down to the deepest cores of its mythopoetic dreams. So that when we uh, begin to then consider the, the possibilities of drone insertion into each of these uh, sectors, um, what is left to take up? The positivity, which is, you know, uh, always uh, luring us forward towards a singularity. Uh, the everyday pragmatics of just code switching between what can be made, the law for the many or the law for the few, and what is left after the remains are gone. Um, at least those were some of the tensions in, in the transversal landscape of uh, drone economies. So in terms of a question to each of you, and uh, I certainly saw a, a, a tension there, was um, uh, a really uh, a core frisson between how you imagine that space to occur. Um, and, and for you, um, David, it, it certainly seemed that it was the biopolitics of affirmation that were at play. Um, for you, the possibility of negotiating um, a space where that affirmation could take place or could be shut down. Uh, for Arthur, um, this space of biopolitics af as after effect, um, 
as being a, a predominant tension in the ecology, um, but again, a, a biopolitics. Um, I leave that question and its unanswerability to each of you. Well, I think you, mm -hmm. you, your, your, your final coda there, I think, mm -hmm. expresses it as to whether or not questions are unanswerable. I find that from my perspective as a Californian who got to explore lightly every realm rather than imbuing heavily in one, I have a tendency to assume that our grandchildren will take for granted answers to things that vex us and confuse us, and they'll have problems of their own. That is, of course, if we can avoid the final scenario that Arthur was talking about, that uh, seems to many people to be the obvious endpoint for humanity. Certainly the Fermi paradox appears to imply that it is an endpoint for a great many civilizations. And as I point out in my new novel, it ain't necessarily so that we are, go that we are going to be the exceptions. But the promise and potential for being exceptions who make it across this minefield is there. We have superseded many stupidities that our grandparents took for granted, and this does not insult them. There is a tendency to assume that if we at all ever state that the Western Enlightenment is an improvement over what came before, that this is some sort of intolerant um, nastiness. When in fact, it is precisely what our ancestors worked to achieve. Our ancestors having brought cultural influence and diversity from every corner of the earth, and having learned an appetite for diversity, having learned an appetite for relentless self-criticism of which the critics of this culture are themselves living examples, often without taking the pause to realize that when they are so deeply criticizing the very culture that imbued them with this habit, they are reflecting and pursuing and almost chauvinistically preaching the core message of that culture because no other culture ever raised its children with the habit that thou shalt by all means as your first reflex criticize the very culture that suckled you. And yet we have millions of intellectuals in our culture who participate in this were taught to do it, suckled at this very positive thing that may have kept us alive and may be our main hope, and never acknowledge the fact that they themselves are exemplifications of the very habit that they think that the civilization ought to show more of. You see this also at the other end of the spectrum where libertarians are incapable of recognizing that no other culture than the one created by Franklin Delano Roosevelt ever created so many libertarians. This ability to step back and look at the meta of what is engaged, what we're engaged in is I think terribly important. And it reflects on what Arthur was talking about so cogently and so articulately. And that is that people might be capable of seeing both the failure modes and the missed opportunities that he refers to. And if they are well-raised and diverse and curious beings who have read my colleague, they might actually be interested in finding ways of having the cake and eating it too. Of having the technology become extensions of ourselves that nevertheless the higher order drones are become welcome into the melange of what we decide to call human. 
and add their diversity and wisdom to that melange, along with uplifted creatures, along with the sessile um, AI, along with things that we invent out of pure boredom or just to be different from each other. That such a culture might actually uh, display wisdom and insight into every single aspect of these things that we're fretting over. The notion that the drones may not be making us more detached from violence, but may be part of the progression of the last 50 years that was started with Edward R. Murrow in, in London during the Blitz and then television, that makes us less tolerant of intolerance because we are able to be there through the medium of the drone. Now this leads into what I talk about in the transparent society, which is the notion of the reciprocality of accountability, which is not a property either of the left or the right because it was first in, uh, spoken of in great detail as an as an antidote to the great failure mode of human civilization that ruined every market system, every renaissance of freedom, and that was feudal aristocracy. And the great critic of this failure mode was Adam freaking Smith, who is called rightfully the first liberal, and we would win this culture war if only liberals would recognize that they should read and embrace him. Because it is the reciprocality of accountability that gets passed the all too human tendency to be blind to our own faults. But reciprocal accountability applies the criticism that enables us to see our faults because our enemies, our opponents, are glad to point out our faults for us. They do this th favor for us for free and you are more than happy to reciprocate the favor this irony is one that it comes in with intellectual property. In the transparent society, I talk about the original purpose of intellectual property as a totally Franklinian, Adam Smithian, pragmatic measure to end 6,000 years of secrecy when you discovered something cool like the Baghdad battery, the Antikythera device, the hero of Alexandria's steam engine. The only way you could benefit from it was by keeping it secret from others. And as a result, we lost all of those things. Intellectual property was invented for a purely pragmatic basis to offer a bribe to creative people to share it. And brilliant jurists such as Posner in Chicago and many others completely missed the point. They actually think that you can ethically and fundamentally own ideas. And I live by copyrights. I will defend them. But that's not what it's about. I do not own ideas. That's insane. What I own is a privilege that was granted to me by society as a pragmatic measure so I can have a house to write in. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Please, I'm yeah, done. I, I think, that, uh, I think that's, uh, that's, so, that's so fascinating, and I remember that, that aspect of um, of your wonderful book, which which I should say is a as a privacy scholar um, and a participant uh, uh, for years now in in the privacy discourse, uh, you know David's book uh, comes up again and again and again for very good very good reasons. Uh, not as not as often as it should, I think, in intellectual property. Um, I mean, one one sort of part of the story that I I want to hear more about is whether you have a two theories, there's two theories I've always wondered, and I've also, I always want to ask you this, and I'll take the opportunity because I think it relates. Um, one is, uh, where does that, because the story about intellectual property is not just a story about an incentive to reveal, it's a story about the incentive to produce. Sometimes it's really hard to lock yourself somewhere and figure out how something works, and perhaps you would only do it if you felt like you could monetize it, right? So do you believe that the drive to create, uh, in my first question, is independent uh, of the uh, 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 of of um, monetary incentives, uh, and that all that's really needed is is people going to create going to going to create, and all that's really needed is to surface it. And then the second question I have is, um, um, and and the reason that I'm skeptical of the premise that um, society will be so fundamentally transparent as to become even and equal, is I just worry that um, there's nothing 
there's no incentive for those who have access to information and have the really good algorithms and can buy the property next to the exchange um, to do any sharing. Um, and so, you know, for, for to talk about drones and privacy for a moment, um, basically what we need is a kind of rhetorical imaginary hook. Uh, so years ago, people will remember that um, that everybody was agitating about there was too much slaughtering of whales. And people were jumping up and down saying, you know, this, we got to restrict this. There's people are slaughtering whales. We're not going to have any more whales, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they really deeply felt it. And they were getting no traction whatsoever until somebody managed to go and record whale songs, right? And they were like these beautiful, haunting, you know, semi-human, um, sort, sort of the opposite of, of a drone in a sense, but, but, but interestingly related. And then when they played those whale songs and then repeated the same calls they've been making uh, to restrict whaling, um, suddenly they got traction where they didn't before. But what's interesting, of course, is that the law, although I called it an instrument, um, you know, it, it differs from ordinary rules of a game that an umpire would announce or that, that govern monopoly, and that it actually justifies coercion, right? I mean, the law is special because it justifies the use of force. And so when someone says you cannot wail and you do so, it justifies the ability ultimately to come and exert force and physically stop you. Um, what's been very difficult has been to have that um, same call attached to the same limitation, the same trade-off attached to um, privacy. Um, and what is so interesting about drones to me is the fact that part of the reason I think they'll succeed as a privacy catalyst where previous um, technologies have failed is because they are soaked in violence and they come to us as a sort of received object soaked in violence that then we're able to turn around and, and reapply and, and, and say, um, look what you're putting into our, into our skies in a way that we were not able to do with, with previous technologies. But the point of the matter is, is that I feel like those, the people who are not the elites, military, industrial elites, have to make claims like that that really resonate um, or they, they won't be able to share in uh, or limit surveillance technology. And so um, what I'm skeptical of is that we'll really, without this sort of real rhetorical triumph and some seriously resonant um, uh, 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 kinds of arguments, that, that there won't be the kind of uh, sharing in that surveillance technology, there won't be limits to surveillance technology, um, which will either lead to a backlash or to a dystopia. Arthur, Arthur yeah. first. Yeah. <laughs> no, th these are really um, great comments in, in terms of uh, David's last comments. Yeah, I would think that um, I wouldn't seem to any extent to be particularly apocalyptic. I think things is a transitional stage, and humans are just getting started, and a new species of existence. It'll be called planetary connectivity, and it's post-human because it's going to be mixed by a lot of hybrid mixing of species, which is already well underway itself. I say well, excuse me. And second, going back to Karen's really eloquent presentation this morning, I agree with Karen that you know we're having, in some extent, a repetition of old patterns in some ways. So you described old patterns in terms of spatial topographies and historian. And I'm a historian as well. I'm a historian of politics, I guess, in some ways, of political ones. So I see a lot of the contemporary California ideology for myself as a Canadian, just trying to figure things out. It's like de Tocqueville said, that Americans are set themselves apart from any other species of existence in the world because they were tough and adaptable. Talcott Parsons, later at the Harvard University, said that the distinguishing characteristic of the American subjectivity is what he called enhancement of adaptive capacity, and he translated that into a sociology. Tocqueville put it more eloquently. Mer Tocqueville said Americans crossed the continent, cross fought the wilderness. They had an axe and a Bible in their respective hands, an axe and a Bible. And he said the worrying thing for him would come is when you'd cross the continent, reach California, created the empire, and then you begin to turn back on the empire itself. Tocqueville's prediction would be, he said, great scenes of sacrificial violence will follow from this. There will be rape and pillage and plunder. So, and just for myself as a moral historian, I'm just, in my mind, is this kind of lingering suspicion that we've reached this point, civilizationally, in terms of a crisis, of a culture that begins to turn back on itself and begins to literally eat itself in terms of its moral appetites. And so I find spectacle, I and disgusting. 
And, and, and certainly the, the question of, of uh, zombie drones, right, at the, at the edge of the sea. Now I open for some questions before everybody leaves. Uh, to our, our fine non-zombie drone uh, community. By Liz, by Liz's uh, son, by Liz's husband that I just met. Yes. It, yeah, is that you, Eric? Yeah. yeah. Speak up. I mean, cer certainly you saw, I mean, and, and I'm cribbing a little from Chris Anderson, who I, I understand couldn't, couldn't be here, uh, uh, but uh, is, is very sophisticated on, on drones. And um, you know, he told The New Yorker recently that uh, even the word drones is kind of unfortunate, I mean, which, which goes to, I think uh, Peter made this point earlier about the renaming of them as, as remotely yeah. piloted. I mean, yeah, that's right. I mean, so the military has one set of... Um, goals in mind and um, they can be awful, they can be really wasteful um, because government contractors don't have the same kinds of incentives. Um, and so, you know, commercializing drones will have the added benefit of getting, you know, Apple's designers to think about what one should really look like, right? Um, but I think what's exciting is not the list that we can all generate through brainstorming of how drones might be useful. It's all the things we haven't thought of, right? I mean, the most interesting things computers can do today are not what they were built for and not what they're anticipated. And, and what's so, what's so crucial is that these platforms be able to be used for anything and that anybody be able to write for them. But of course, again, that's also what's so dangerous because some set of people will write something really neat and another set of people will write something really goofy like dive bomb Peter app, you know, that just does facial recognition and when he sees Peter dive bomb, you know what I mean? And so like people will do goofy things and then that'll be like the end of, of you know, the Paradise drum. What, yeah, and one last thing about this, and I'll shut up. But I mean, um, w when the paired AR drone that I keep mentioning, this toy, uh, it, when you control it with your iPhone, uh, the first app anybody wrote was a rec video recording app. It was the first one they ever wrote. And when you click on it, uh, it has this little legal disclaimer come up, and it says, "Don't use this to violate anyone's privacy." You know, and you and you click through, and you say, "Okay, uh, problem solved." You know, what I mean? and so it's just you know. Well, the thing is that the thing is with the UAV, I, I talk about this in the Transparent Society, the flying of little mosquito cams into your bedroom. The, the, the key element to that is the same thing, ironically, as Big Brother in, in Orwell in 1984. 
And that is, you'd think that one is big brother and the other some little baby brother down the block, some pimple-faced voyeur, but the fact is that it all comes down to the same thing. If the telescreen in 1984 were reciprocal, 100% reciprocal, and all the proletariats could look at every party member, despite the disparities of power, 20 years later, it would be a very, very, very different country. Very different country. Even starting out with huge disparities of, of who has practical power. You ask me, can light equalize? Light is the principal equalizer. You then add other enlightenment innovations like breaking up of power, which is what the right wings, uh, what the Murdochians, or as we H.G. Wells fans like to call them, the Murdochs, um, <laughs> They, what they are trying to do is eliminate all elites from society except for the moneyed aristocracy, which is the identical one that Adam Smith called the great enemy across 4,000 years of opportunity and markets and even capitalism. If we combine the breaking up of power and the enhancement of NGOs that can happen through the internet with copious light, then what you're talking about is an ingredient that can result in a considerable equalization of power, and I can say that with confidence, because it's precisely how we got the power that we've got, the e relative equality and freedom and rights that we've got now. Uh, it's not hiding from the mighty that works, it's stripping the mighty naked. It's putting a choke chain on the watchdog to make sure it remembers it's a dog and not a wolf. Um, Arthur, you mentioned um, de Tocqueville worrying about what would happen when Americans fi finished crossing the continent, but there was someone more recent, Frederick Jackson Turner, or is it Frederick Turner Jackson? Frederick Jackson Turner. I've got to remember that. I keep getting it screwed up. <laughs> Who wrote the closing of the um, American West and was very worried but did not go for the reflexive assumption that his first worry was going to happen. He posited the possibility of an alternative, that once the frontier closed, perhaps it would not result in Americans becoming the same as every other people, close-minded, feudalistic, traditionalistic, but that they would have the habit of frontiers so deeply ingrained in their character by then that they would simply find other frontiers. He did not think this was likely, but he was honest enough to posit this, this as an exception to his theory. And within 10 years after the publication of his book, Americans were flying through the sky. So the question is, can this continuous process of finding a place to vent the frontier spirit that we have lately done with what Al Gore legitimately claims to have invented, the internet. A lot of people don't realize that when he was a senator, he was the principal author and the principal subsidizer of several bright people who came up with the bill that did probably the most amazing decision that powerful people have ever done in the history of humanity. And that's just telling AT&T and IBM to go to hell when they wanted to make a government-imposed network and instead simply gave the internet to the world. If any one man was responsible for that decision, and it was actually dozens of men and women, but if any one man typified it and coalesced it, it was Al Gore. So well, I one of my problems with uh, frontier culture is there's always an indigenous community at that edge, and they tend to be the sacrifice uh, of that frontier's expansion. Um, and it's not always the same uh, group, but uh, I'll there just stop that. there. Uh, was there somebody else? Questions? No? Mm -hmm. I um, can say one. Yeah, please, Art. Mm -hmm. There's a companion volume to Front Return to Frontier, Keystone Frontier, and that would be a more recent written by Michael Weinstein, which is called uh, The Wilderness and the City. It's a, a neglected text in American political culture. Wilderness City, the, which is a study of contemporary American moral philosophy, is an important text, particularly in its um, conclusion, where Weinstein develops a really an interesting thesis that he says that the frontier thesis is based upon a form of subjectivity which has two polarities to it. It has a kind of violent war spirit, a spirit of 
conquering the wilderness in terms of a, a struggle to dominate on the one hand. And then it falls into Sicilia. It actually creates, it creates again and again the Christian, what the Christians like to call Sicilia, which is a spirit of just being weary of the world itself. Boredom, tedium, sense of loss of energy, wanting a messiah to and, save the and, culture. And you and don't think there's a third one, which is the self-reinvention, the reinvention no. of the self? Yeah, if you let me finish. Go ahead. Sorry. If you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah, because Weinstein's thesis is that the animating energy of the American technological personality is precisely lies between the two. It says what makes Americans different is Americans have transformed the principle of reversal of the poles of a CD on the war spirit, or the ones in the zero of metaphor and metonymy. There's lots of choose your discourse and you get the polarities, and have the courage and the creativity to ride the struggle in the middle itself. What he left out in that analysis, though, was exactly what Ricardo said, is the carnage and the exterminism of indigenous peoples itself, which is the beginning of a story, telling of another story itself. Yes. But one answer to that is that sodomy is becoming less and less illegal because people have been forced to confront what is necessary to be illegal and the hypocrisies of earlier things that could be blithely ignored by average citizens and no longer can be. I want to build on that answer too. I mean, I have a, um, a, a, a paper that's called The Boundaries of Privacy Harm where I articulate what I believe privacy harm is. Um, and, and precisely to David's point, one of the things I argue is that sometimes things are called, are labeled privacy, um, and that serves to mask what the real uh, issue is, which might be liberty or equality. Um, so we treat, for a time, we treated sodomy um, like it was obscenity in the sense that in the obscenity cases, obscenity was technically, it was okay to regulate because it didn't fall under the First Amendment, you know, according to the Stanley case. Um, but we said, look, if it's in your house, you know, it's fine because you know, we can regulate it. But if it's in your house, we won't, we won't bother with it. Essentially the same thing that we said about sodomy. But then that doesn't force us to confront this central question, which is should people of the same gender be able to have sex if they want to, right? Um, and so I think it's really careful. You have to be really careful about figuring out what you mean by privacy harm because if you call everything privacy, then it obscures things. And I, so to da precisely David's point, I completely agree that one of the reasons that it's no longer able to support claims that sodomy should be illegal is precisely because we've gotten past that layer of, of just saying what's taking place in your home. And at no, but yeah. that's the very point. Mm -hmm. That's the very point. And that is that as we get more eyes, as the eyes proliferate everywhere, we're going to choose between city A and city B. And in city A, we appear to have privacy because we've made illegal all the drones and all the prying eyes. And all that means is that, they, as Heinlein said, privacy laws simply make the spy bugs smaller. Never in human history has an elite ever been prevented from seeing as well as an elite could possibly see, ever. And the result will be that elites of commerce, elites of wealth, elites of government, all, but they'll do it secretly. Or city B, in which we all embrace this, and we all realize this is going on, and then we can enter the world of reciprocity. And, the, and, the, and if someone flies a little drone into your uh, bedroom, 
and uh, is, is spying on you, some hobbyist in your neighborhood has the right latest scanner and knocks on your door and says, I've been doing a routine scan. You know, there are emanations coming from your house. Is this you? Is this yours? No, that's not mine. And well, then they follow it back to the pimple-faced little schmuck's house and tell his mom. The point is that in theory, we should be able to do most of these things ourselves. Now, in practice, we're going to need governments, we're going to need NGOs, we're going to need that smart neighbor. But we should not be prevented from entering a regime in which mostly we are left alone and we still have some privacy in a world of cameras because it is more embarrassing to be caught violating our privacy than anything that we're likely to do. And the things that we're likely to do are mostly because our kids have invested in this, because they've shown so many embarrassing pictures on Facebook. It's like investing their 30-year-old selves down the road with the obligation to have a tolerant society, because I did something embarrassing online when I was 15. It's like they're almost viscerally, instinctively choosing to do this now. And it's an investment. And, and I don't know that it's going to work. But it's the only thing that can work because it works. You go to a restaurant. You sit in the restaurant. You are amidst a crowd of people who can see you and almost hear you. And yet, no one leans in and no one eavesdrops why because the opprobrium from being caught leaning in and eavesdropping is worse than anything they're likely to pick you up saying. It's a version of mutual assured destruction. It's reciprocity, it's competitive, and it is not the real reason why we were preached that we should behave well. We've been preached behave well because it's moral and ethical. And what works with human beings is I might get caught. Well, that's why uh, to create a binary between transparent um, ecologies and opaque economies is to, you know, constantly schizophrenically move back and forth within them and, and, and perhaps uh, be bound without a space of negotiation. So in a certain sense, what is at play or what the gamble and risk is a translucent society in which aspects of opacity and transparency are negotiated in, in multiple ways. Um, and those negotiations aren't always um, uh, habitual. They have to be um, re-enunciated, uh, backtracked. Uh, sometimes the algorithm is to go sideways and, or, or, or to hide. Uh, so I, I do think that uh, uh, with dronology, if we can accept that as a, as a switching point between uh, these valencies, um, it, it might be that we have to negotiate something uh, in the liminal space between that transparency, um, even radical transparency, and the feudalism of opacity. Um, and it becomes a difficult space to negotiate via uh, laws, morality, ethics, when one is in a translucent space. Uh, but at the same time, it does offer possibilities to, to shift that code. Um, I think we have time for one last question, and then we can ha shoot up with coffee and uh, watch a flick, and we can see it in 4D. Yes.
that sounds more like Arthur's territory than mine. I just think that I, I can just show you that it's inevitable and that some things, when they become more common and more accessible, become less valuable. How many of you have ever flown through the sky or entered a room and made life happen with your fingertip? Uh, these were the powers of gods. I mean, the biggest mistake that was ever made in the Apollo program was immediately should be uh, broadcast in the images. It should have been held secret and leaked. We would have all been very excited. So, hooray for leaky culture. Uh, so, thank you so much. I really appreciate the panelists and the time. And uh, so, take a uh, durational break of some interest, grab some sun, and then come back in at five for Sleep Dealer. Um, That's a very good movie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>